has. Huh? That song that says he has. I myself couldn't conquer death. But what what he do? He has. He's already done it. He has already conquered death. When he died on the cross and got back up, when the breath entered his lungs, and he walked out of that tomb, death was conquered. Satan has no power anymore because he has conquered that. I and myself can't conquer the, the, the sin in my life. I and myself can't conquer the addiction in my life, in our lives. But he, he has. He has already conquered all that. that the, anything that we face, he's already gone plumb past it. He's already out in front of it. He's, he's already conquered it. And that's the beautiful thing about that is that he has. It's not like it's a challenge waiting on him to, to do that. No, he's already done it. So everything, when we live right now, when we live in his victory, we live in a victory that's conquered everything. That nothing stands against because he stands above everything else. That is something to hope in. And that's, that's where our salvation lies. If it lies in that, it lies in true victory. And it lies in perfection. And <laughs> We're more than conquerors, right? We are more than conquerors. What is more than conqueror? I don't know, but we are. We are through Jesus Christ. More than conquerors? We conquer Satan. We conquered the grave and we conquered the death because of what he did. Not because I myself can't bring myself to salvation, but he has. Through his blood, through his son. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're going to say that. Uh, so I really like this. This, this metaphor of salvation, I think I've said it a hundred times, but it's so good because it, it gives us a, a perfect depiction of what our salvation is, the, the lifeguard scenario. I'll never get tired of hearing this. The, the lifeguard scenario where we're out there on the ocean and we're drowning and he throws us a life preserver and we like, yeah, it's a life preserver and swim back over. <laughs> That's not where we were. We were dead at the very bottom of the ocean. We were a skeleton. We, there was no life, nothing to even look like life left in us. And we were dead. We were completely darkness. We were defined by the water. We were defined by the death that was that was that defines us. We were dead. But what did he do? He came down to where we were. He didn't just save us. He came down to the very place where we were in our lowest depravity. And he said, I got you. And he brought us and he gave us that life. He breathed life into us. And now our lungs breathe the breath of life. Our lungs breathe the spirit of who he is. And he didn't just, he didn't just take that death away. He took it upon himself. And when he had taken it upon himself, defeated it. It's no, it's no longer a deal for us. We don't have to worry about death anymore because we've been brought back out of it. We don't, he didn't leave it. He didn't save us and leave us to stay down there at the bottom of our depravity. No, he picked us back up and pulled us back to the very top to where we can live victoriously. And so that now people can see our lives and now people can see the, the, the victory that we live in. And they're like, man, what, what's this guy's, you know, what's this lady's, this guy's problem? What's, I mean, what? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is the only way, the only reason that we live the way that we do, the only reason that we live as conquerors in this world is because of what Jesus Christ has done. And when we when we live in that, man, people see that and they want they start wanting to know about that and that. That's why God put us on this earth is to bring glory to Him and other people to see us and bring glory and to bring glory to Him. And so that's pretty cool. He has. I'm glad I didn't have to do anything myself because I can't. I'm stupid. <laughs> Idiotic, wretched. I mean, I'm just low life. But he, gosh, in him is perfection. And we get to live in that. That's something to be excited about. So um, where I've been at is Psalms 130. But um, we're just kind of coming. I'm just kind of, God's just now taking me out of it. And we're, we're going to talk about a little bit about um Kind of what we talked about in Sunday school this morning is uh, what do we do from now? What do we do now that now that we're out of Psalms 130? But first off, we'll give you a little overview of what's been happening here. And so I'm just going to we'll just read this for you. 100, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice and let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy and for supplication. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Yes. With God there is forgiveness. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. More than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. That hope means confidence. Have confidence in the Lord. For with
with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will, will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Notice that. He says will. He will. If we come to him totally broken in who we are, he will forgive us. He will redeem us from the sin that once, like I said, defined us. And so kind of an overview of what's happening here. David, you know, it says, out of the depths, I cry to you. David is completely broken down in and of himself. Why? Because of his sin. David has willfully sinned, and he sees that. God's convicted him of it, and he's like, God, I'm sorry. He's completely broken. He's in the bottom of the depth of who he is because he has sinned against God, and God has shown him his sin. And so that's where David's at right now. And as we go on down through here, we talk about repentance. This whole passage right here is about repentance because we start with sin and we end with forgiveness, right? That's the amazing thing about God. That's amazing. That's our lives, right? We started out in sin, but now because of Jesus Christ, we are defined by his forgiveness. Our story started with sin and now it ends with forgiveness and perfection. And that's awesome. None of us deserve that, but God was such a loving God that he gave it to us freely. Freely gave it to us. And if you don't know that today, know it. Come to know him. Amen. Now, um, for repentance, for true repentance, for true repentance, what, what's the first step of true repentance? As we see here, he's saying, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. He's in the broken. He's broken. We have to get broken for our sin. We can't continually live in sin and expect ourselves to grow spiritually. It's not going to work that way. We have to be broken and just completely broken for our sin. Because if we're not broken for our sin, that means we love our sin. That's that right. means that we love our sin more than God. If we are not broken for it, because that's, again, it's a beautiful thing about the Bible. Because there's no 50-50, half and half. We either love it or we hate it. That's right. We either love God or we hate God. And so where are we at right now? Do, are, we, are we living in our sin? And do we continually choose it? Continually choose it? Continually choose it? Because if that's the case, man, we love our sin. We love our sin more than we love God. And that's what David, that's where David's at here. He's seen that. And he's and God's convicted him. He's like, God, I have. God, I, I have loved my sin more than you. So I'm broken for that. And that's where we have to, that's a first step in repentance. Is if we want repentance in our lives, we gotta get sick of this junk. We gotta get sick of the sin that's in our lives that continually is beating us down. We have to get sick of it. That's right, son. And so, in and of ourselves, we can't pull ourselves out of sin, like, like we talked about earlier this morning. We can't pull ourselves out of sin, but we can get sick of sin. God has allowed us the choice to be sick of our sin or to choose our sin. And so, it's one or the other, right? Yes. We're either going to live in it, we're going to choose it, we're going to love it, or we're going to live in God. We're going to choose God, we're going to love God. Amen. And so, if we're not loving God, we're loving our sin. And so, that's, that's something to take stock in today, is allow God to come into our lives and show us what, show us where we're at. Because when we do that, when we come completely and totally broken, that's where he works. That's where he, that's where he wants us at. Because when we're at that point, there is no pride that's built up in our lives. Because we realize God has shown us that there, we have nothing to be proud about. That we're just wretched. And so when we come to that, God works in that. Because when, he, when we're totally broken, we're, to, we're laying there before God saying, God, do what you want with me. And so that's where we should be at. That's where, that's where David's at right here. And that's where we have to be at for true repentance is that's to be right. totally broken and totally humbled because of the, the, the weight and the depravity of our sin. Uh -huh. So we get through that. We see David sees God's forgiveness. And that's, that's awesome because that's a whole story in the Bible is repentance. That's God's song that he sings over his children, his redemption. And that's, a, that's the amazing thing about this. And David sees that. And so you get to verse 5 down here, and he's like, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in this word I hope. And so the word wait uh, means, we don't know what it means. It means wait, right? Well, when you, when you get to looking uh, a little further into the Hebrew, there's, it means tension. So there's tension and wait. So it's like, what, what does wait and tension have to do with each other? Well, we go to getting a gift, right? It's your birthday, man. You, you get you parents or whoever, spouse, has a, a huge gift, and it's right in front of you. Is there not tension in that moment? You're like, oh, yes, I can't wait to get this. I can't wait to see what it is. You know, there's actually been a study done that says you are most happy right before you get a gift because that's when the, that's when the emotions and the endorphins and everything are built completely up, and then that's when you that's when you most enjoy a gift before you even see it. You know, isn't that crazy? That's how we are. Anyway, 
So there, there's tension in that moment of where we're about to get a gift and we're waiting. And so that's what, that's what David's at right here. That's the way we should be with God. We should be, when God has forgiven us, we should be like, God, I'm excited to see what you're going to do with my life. I'm excited now because of what I've been forgiven of, because of what, I, what you have brought me out of. I'm excited to now see what you're going to do with me because the power that it takes to pull somebody out of sin and completely remake them, that is an immense amount of power, right? And now that power gets to be used to further the gospel. It gets to be used in your life. God gets to use that power through you to reach people. And that's what he's saying. He's like, God, I'm excited to see what you're going to do with me. And that's that's where we're supposed to be at right now. We're supposed to. So where this, where this all ends out at is right there with David saying, God, I'm excited to see what you're going to do with me. Do with me what you want. And that should be that should be all of us, man. We should be saying, God, I want you to do with me what you want to do with me. And this spills over into worship. We should be excited about worship. We should be excited about getting to come here and enjoy with each other the, the worship of a holy God. Because that's, that's exciting to be able to come and sit amongst a body of believers and enjoy that with each other. That's an exciting thing. And so we should be extremely excited about worship. Anyway, we should be excited, right? Okay. Now, that's where we're at. Um, now, we're going to go uh, to 2 Samuel 23, which is where we're going to pull our main text from. Boy, look there. Just open right up to it. How about that? So we're at this point of excitement. We're at this point of God. At, even in here, everywhere is a battlefield. Everywhere for us as Christians are, is a battlefield. And if we are not fighting 24-7... We're running, and we can't. God God commands us to take a stand and to fight, because just like he said, he'll do it through us. It's not in our own strength. It's not in our own power. We don't have to do it. He will work the victory through us. Amen. So we are we are commanded to fight sin. It's not a choice that, we, that, you know, that God gives us. No, he says if we want to live victoriously, if we want to live unbound by Satan's chains, we're to go out and we're to kill sin. We're to go out and we're to make war with it, right? That's what that's the whole that's the whole deal. That's what we're called to do. That's discipleship. <laughs> you know, we're out and making war and showing other people how through Jesus Christ how to make war. And that's that's the that's the Christian's life is war making. We are warriors. That's we are warriors in Jesus Christ. That's something that we should that we should keep in the back of our mind each day as we go out to make war. It's all about war. Because Satan, Satan, Satan's going to make war against us whether we make it or not, right? right. He's going to come at us with everything he's got. And so we have to take a stand. We have to have the intestinal fortitude of Jesus Christ that he gives to take a stand on our pea patch and fight. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a commandment. It's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. Now, we'll go into verse 12. Mm. Where is it? Oh, here it is. But he took... He took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines. And the Lord worked a great victory. If we stand in God's name, we will see victory. If we stand in his name, we will see victory. Why? Because he is victory. Because he is the epitome. He is the definition of victory. Because he has conquered everything. He's conquered everything in the world. Every sin, every every problem, depression, anxiety, whatever. Whatever. He's conquered it, and he stands victorious above it. And so when we hope in him, when we stand in him like Shema did, Shema stood in the name of God, it doesn't matter how insurmountable we think it is because he is victorious, because he is always victorious. He never loses. It's not His loss is not a word in his vocabulary. He is victory. He is victory. It's not he's described by victory. He is victory. Amen. That is his definition. Amen. It is victory. So, and this is a, an interesting thing that a guy on Moody was talking about, uh, talking about kind of the same deal. But this, this type of prayer, this type of, you know, saying, God, I'm going to stand in your name, is a very powerful thing because it's calling God to act upon his word. It's calling God's character into question. Not in the, not in the bad sense of calling it into question, but it's calling God saying, God, I'm going to do 
you know, you've called me to do this, and I'm going to stand here and do it. And you said if I do it in your name, that you'd work the victory. So I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to do it the way that you the way that you tell me to. I'm going to stand in your name. And so now it's up to you. It's it's you. It's yours now. And so when he when that happens, he's like, I got you. I got you. And when that happens, when we stand there, that's the way he that's the way he works. That just came. Jeff Pike, his daughter is in uh, the Amazon, right? She's doing like a medical mission thing down there. That's where God will take us like that. And it doesn't even have to be that way. But when we stand like that, when we say, God, I'm standing in your name, and you take me and you use me wherever you want to, that's what God will do with us. And it's not even, it doesn't even have to be to the Amazon. It could be just down the road, right? But when we stand there and when we, when we say, God, you use me the way that you want to use me, that's when people get reached. That's when people see Jesus Christ, and that's when he uses us to bring people to him. That is, that's, the, that's the call of a missionary. That's the call of what all of us are supposed to be doing and saying, God, I'm going to stand here. And it doesn't matter about my speech problems. It doesn't matter about how I'm not smart enough or I'm not this, I'm not that. I'm not. God says you don't have to be. You don't have to be. All you have to do is to stand in who I am, and I'm going to do the work for you. You just stand here and you be obedient and you be humble and you be earnest with me and I will use you that way. It doesn't matter about how you think you have physical limitations. The physical limitations don't apply to God, right? He, he created us. He knows everything about us. His, the limitations that we put on ourselves, God breaks. God busts completely. It's a chain. It's chains used by Satan to where people, when we say that, he loves to, 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 to throw that in our face to say that we are not smart enough. We have all these limitations because it's holding us back from doing what we're supposed to be doing, right? But when we say, God, I'm just going to stand here and I'm going to stand in your name because you promised to work through me. It doesn't matter. He overcomes the limitations. It's, it's, it's through, through him there is no limitations. And in that, that's when people get reached. And that's when God takes us. To places that we never thought possible, and not not in the monetary sense or anything like that, but taking us to places to where we're sharing the sharing the gospel with people, taking us to spiritual places we never thought possible. Right? That's where He works. That's where He works. And when we get honest, when we get earnest with Him, that's where He works, and that's where He'll work through us. Amen. So, God wants soldiers who don't look back. Yeah. Right? God wants soldiers who are not. Wishy washy, right? He doesn't want soldiers who are going to who are going to run and then see the battle, and like freak out and then turn back around. He wants warriors who are going to stand, like I said, stand in His name and fight, no matter what the cost is, no matter if it's the cost of our family disowning us or the loss of a job. If we stand in God's name, that's all He wants, and He will take care of the rest. That's that's the promise that He makes. Is if we stand in who He is, He takes care of it all. He works. He works, and so we don't have to do anything. That's so awesome, you know, because it gives us hope. It gives us confidence and gives us more confidence in him because we see that, yeah, we're weak and we're dumb and we can't do anything. But through God, we do all things. That's right. Yeah, we do everything through him because he gives all power. So um, it's also kind of like we talked about with Ray this morning. It's like. Soldiers are not going to give 100% to a cause that they don't believe in, right? Soldiers are not going to stand and give their, and just leave it all on the battlefield, what, what, no matter the cost, if they don't believe, first off, in the cause of what they're fighting for, right? They're not, it's, it's, so where are we at? Do we believe 100% in the cause of Jesus Christ? Do we believe 100% in who he is and who he says he is? Do we believe in the cause of Christ? Because if we do, if we believe 100% in his cause, we'll go to war. And it's, it, doesn't matter about the, it doesn't matter about the cost of war because we know we're winners either way, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter about our physical. The physical doesn't matter anymore because we see that what, what's at stake is people's lives. People's lives are at stake in the way that we live. And in this war that we're waging, it's people's lives seeing Jesus Christ. And that, there's nothing more valuable than, right? There's nothing more valuable than a soul, than somebody, than a, than a soul of a human being. And our hearts should break for those people who don't have Christ. And it's like, it's like Jake said, it's like, if our hearts don't break for that, 
get right with God. You know what I mean? Right? If our hearts are not breaking for the lost people, there's something wrong there, guys. Our hearts should be broken and for the people who don't have what we have, who don't have the Spirit of God within inside, who don't have the victory, because we see what we've been delivered from. We see the wretchedness, the lowly state that we've been plucked out of, and we want other people to experience that. And we want other people to come to know the victory, the holiness of God. And so our hearts should break for those who don't have Him. And so that's why we should be out making war and bringing Christ to people. That's why it's so important and so important that we realize that it's a war. It's not just something that we can sit complacent in. It's a war. We're either doing one of two things. We're either fighting or we're running. And so we can make it right. Well, we can. God can. If we get broken for us leaving the ranks and running, God says he'll He'll forgive us. Like what it said in the... In, there is forgiveness with God. There is forgiveness with God. And so when we get broken, He cleans us up, suits us up, and tells us to go right back out. And so we go back back out to war. Yeah. And so that's the beautiful thing about it, is that He doesn't He doesn't kill it, He doesn't kill the retreaters. You know? He He forgives them and turns them around and says, Go back out to war. And so they do, you know. That's what's awesome about being in God's army. And it's also awesome that we never lose, right? That's what it's what. So, so here, this is where we're at, right? It's just a stupid field. It is just a field full of peas, right? It's to, why are we making all this fuss about a field of peas? Well, that's a good question. Uh, justification, when we justify sin in our lives, it causes stagnation. It causes us to, to, to not... To feel, we just kind of, we just, uh-huh. we're okay, right? When we, when we're justified in our sin, when we come up with a justification for our sin, we can sit complacent because we, we build it up in our own pride to where we're, we're not wrong. You know, everybody sins, right? And so we just kind of, we, we'll come to church and we'll, you know, do all the things and we'll pray, but there, there's no significant growth in our lives because we're harboring sin in our lives, and that's. That's, all, that's what it's about. It's not just one pea field. It's not just one pea field, right? Because eventually, eventually, there's no more ground. Right. There's eventually, you eventually run out of ground, right? Because the Philistines come in to the pea field, and they're like, oh, okay, so the Israelites back off the pea field. Well, that's an awfully good-looking cornfield over there. And so they're weak the first time. Let's go take the cornfield. And then they go take the cornfield. Yeah. Well, the same principle applies in our lives. Satan will come in. But he'll take, we'll, we'll give him. He doesn't take, we give. He gives, or we give this, this pea field in our lives. We give him this much area. And then he's like, oh, yeah, you're willing to back up off of that? Well, I'm going to come for more. And then he does, and we keep backing up, and we keep backing up, and we keep backing up until we're against a wall. And he's pounding our head against the wall because we've let him come into our lives, and we've let him come in and chain us up and defeat us. And so that's why it's so important. It's so important. It's not just one sin. It's not just one pea field, right? It's not. Because when we keep backing up, it shows our weakness. It shows that we're not willing to stand in the name of Jesus Christ and to fight. And so when Satan sees that, he's like, yeah, I got you right where I want you now. And it, it may not even be a quick thing. It may be over the span of 40 years, but the same principle applies. He's going to back us up and back us up and try to make us as numb as possible to where he's beating our head in the ground and we like it. That's what his whole goal is, right? His whole goal is to have us backed up against it and he's pounding our head back. And we're like, oh yeah, yeah, that's nice. That's not the way we're supposed to live. We're supposed to get angry at this stuff. We're supposed to be angry when we sin because we we have the holy we have the, the holy fire of God inside of us that's sick and hates sin and can't stand it. That's where we're supposed to be at. Do we do it all the time? No. Gosh, I know I don't. I don't get as angry at sin as I should, and that's why I guess that's why God has us right here is because He's trying to show me. <laughs> Get more sick of your sin because when we get sick of our sin, that's where God uses it. God just says, okay, yeah. And he takes us in and, and we go back out to battle, right? That's what we can't sit back and enjoy an abusive relationship because it seems that Christians love to run. As from personal experience, we seem to love to run towards abusive relationships, right? We seem to love to run towards the relationship 
When I say abusive relationship, I'm talking about sin. We seem to want to run towards the sin and the relationship with Satan where it's just abuse. It's continual abuse where he uses it and beats us over the head and chains us up. That's what he loves to do, right? And that's not a, that's not a relationship. But God said, just taste and see, boy. Like the psalm says, you know, just taste and see that I'm good. And when we get a taste of that, man, ooh, that's all we want, right? That's all we want because we see that he's goodness. We see that he's victory. We see that he's everything that we've been lacking in our life because we're nothing. He is everything to us. And when we when we see that, when we taste that, and we see that, we want more of it. We want more of it. And when we, can keep, when we keep wanting more of it, we get in the word. And when that happens, we start taking the ground back that Satan has, t- has taken from us, that we've given to him. We say, uh-uh. No, it ain't happening no more. And so we go back to war. We take our pea field back, right? Because it's not just one pea field. It's, it's the victory. It's the deciding factor between winning and living a victorious Christian life and living in defeat. And that's why it's so important that it's not just the pea field. That's why it's so important that we, that we get sick of our sin, that we get totally broken for what we've done. Because when we do, gosh, God stands there. Is ready to forgive us when we are broken, just completely and totally broken. That's where He stands, to forgive us, and cleans us up, suits us up, and takes us right back out to war. So we have to stand and protect what God's given us. Right? We have to stand and protect the witness. That's what's most important in all of our lives right now. And it's what binds us all is our witness. Now, there's also where this applies to families, to the fathers and the mothers that God has giving you children or grandchildren or whatever, those are yours to protect. God has given you those children to protect. But I don't know anything about that. So we know the, the witness. The witness is what we all have, right? That's what binds all of us, no matter the age of the Christian. The witness is what binds us. And that's what God has told us to stand on and to fight because that is our pea field. The witness that we have, the witness that God has given us is the pea field in which we're supposed to stand and we're supposed to fight because Satan wants that and Satan wants to parade that around when we give it to him. And so that's why it's so important that we stand up and that we wage war against him because it's not... We have to wage war. We have to. It's not... It's not there is no other way. We have to stand on it and we have to go to war with Satan. And that's the call for all of us today because if we haven't, God says, I'm ready to forgive. I will forgive you. And as if we are broken totally, and, you know, if we're earnest with God, if we're true with God, he will forgive us for that. And he will say, all right, now it's time to go back to war with you. If, if, all of, if any of us are sitting here and want to get back to war, that's the way. Repentance is the way to get back to war. And God says he'll do it, and he'll send us back to war. So if we're back in war, right? How do we maintain this mindset? How do we maintain, how do we keep going and keep going in this war that we're fighting? Well, we find that in Romans. We'll go to Romans 8, verse 5. No, that's not Romans, that's Paul. I'm just going to read down to 5 because the first part of this chapter is awesome. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's awesome. There is no, we're not defined by the sins that we want to, that we're not condemned anymore. When we have the blood of Christ, when, when, <laughs> when the blood of Christ is on our doorpost, that, there is no condemnation for that. There is no condemnation when, because all he sees is the blood of the lamb. All he sees is the, the lamb's perfection over us. So that's pretty cool. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Here we go. This is how we maintain. This is how, this is how we continue to fight. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. What we set our minds on is what's going to rule our lives. 
what we continually, what we set, what, we're, what our affections are set to, what we're continuously thinking about, what our heart longs after, is what's going to control our lives. And so when we, when we put our, our, our minds and our hearts on Christ, that's where, that's, that's where, this, where we can continually live this life of war, where we can continually go out and we can continually live in the abundance of who He is. And that's how we go out and continue to stay in this war and continue to fight and continue to fight. And that's how, you know, these, these saints of God that are, you know, 80-something years old have done it for all their lives because they set their minds on the things of God. Uh -huh. And that's what's awesome, like uh, the story of Polycarp. And I don't know if any of you have heard the story of Polycarp. He's like 80-something years old. And he was, uh, they were going to burn him at the stake for being a Christian. I think, yeah, burn him for being a Christian. And, uh... They're like, Polycarp, we'll give you one more chance, bro. I come off of there and, you know, we won't burn you. And he's like, ah, God ain't left me through these 80 years. He ain't going to leave me now. Gosh, isn't that awesome? God hasn't left me. God hasn't left us up to this point. God's not going to leave us. He's not. And so when we continually, like Polycarp, set our minds on the things of God, he won't leave us. He will never leave us. He never leaves or forsakes his children. Isn't that awesome? So... Um, this will be a end right here, and then Frank can come on and uh, close us out however he wants. Um, if our mind is set on Christ, like, it's, like we said, he gives us the strength and the power to continue to fight. Because it's not our strength, it's not our power that we fight in. It's When we wage war, it's in the strength and it's in the power of Jesus Christ. And that's where we've got to draw our power from, is in him. Because when he lives through us... There's nothing that can stand in our way. Thank you, son. That's good. Let's stand together.